to learning and, and know that uh, we don't know everything. And uh, it hasn't worked out that way. Uh, one of the one of the students is uh, one of my fellow coaches. He's actually kind of our our lead uh, for the team. We have another guy who's actually the head coach, but um, this guy's right up there with him. And uh, he's a PR guy for the Forest Service, so he really has a lot of connections. He's really good with people and going to these meetings and, and uh, whatnot. And so very, very grateful for him. Um, but he doesn't know a whole lot about bicycle mechanics. And, you know, I got to give him credit. He took my class so that he could learn more about it and about what I do. So... Um, that's just going to bring him further along, get him a little bit more into the sport. And that's kind of, you know, what it's all about. Uh, hopefully he can gain some knowledge that he can use, uh, you know, on, on the practice rides with the, uh, with the students. So last week we talked about, um, just general knowledge, you know, um, terminology, uh, learning the language of the bicycle. Uh, which is very, very old. They've been around for a very long time and getting them familiarized with all the different parts and how, you know, uh, there's different names for like the whole wheel and, and then there's individual parts of the wheel. And, and uh, so far, uh, everybody seems to have been picking it up pretty good. Um, today, I'm actually planning to get into uh, drivetrain adjustment or uh, derailleur tuning as you might call it. And uh, that's, that's a good one to get past because I've found that most people, when they're wanting to learn about bikes, it's to learn how to, how to adjust the gears. And uh, we, I take them through it very, very thoroughly from uh, the very beginning, you know, just like why it's designed the way it is. And it's a more holistic approach, but I think it allows people to, regardless of what uh, equipment they're working on, what manufacturer of parts, how many speeds, all of that, uh, they'll still be able to fix a lot of the issues with it. So, yeah, uh, it, it's actually something that I very much enjoy and uh, it does take up my time. Uh, you know, I'm volunteering my efforts to help out the Bicycle Coalition. Um, but I believe in what they do. Uh, they have uh, several programs, you know, uh, this one, you know, just uh, uh, people can sign up and, and learn more about bicycle mechanics. They have all the tools, several tool stations, so it's all hands-on and uh, makes for a great, great environment. Um, but they also have programs where you can earn your own bicycle by volunteering. And uh, so if you're looking for a bicycle for transportation, uh, you can get one without actually spending any money on it. And uh, they provide all the parts and you just work uh, a certain number of hours helping other people, uh, which is actually what the mechanics class is all about. Uh, the hope was, uh, like I said, my time is limited. And so, uh, you know, rather than being there all the time, which I can't do, uh, it's two towns away, and uh and would be a problem uh, i decided it would be better to bring other people uh up to speed so to speak and get more uh, people with more mechanical abilities so that they can volunteer and be effective at the bicycle coalition so um, that's why we call it the master class not that they're going to be a master mechanic by the end of it but we're hoping to uh, help them to help other people. Anyway, uh, yeah, like I said, it's, it's a pretty cool uh, thing to be involved in. And uh, it's interesting how there's so much crossover, you know, between these uh, volunteer organizations. And uh, it's been a good networking experience for me, uh, getting to know people, feeling more a part of my own community and uh, the area, you know, and uh, yeah, I've, I've had a really good time with it. So I'll probably continue to do that unless I can't. Anyway, let's uh, see what's over here on the table. 
we did some work yesterday on the uh, on the box itself, <laughs> and uh, since I I have the uh, front cut out, oh, that camera I think got knocked around. There we go. So uh, did some work cleaning up the cut on the front of the drawer uh, because it was cut with uh, sawzall. And uh, we did some sanding and cleaning it up uh, on both boxes yesterday. And uh, so these are kind of all prepared. I really don't have to do a whole lot other than uh, replace all of the wooden components. But as I said, uh, I've only got one coat of sanding sealer on, on those pieces. Um, that's these right here. And uh, I didn't want to make the stream about me putting on sanding sealer. So uh, I'll, I'll wait until I can get another coat on here. Um, all these components will be painted black um, before they're placed inside of there. And that's what holds the, uh, that's what holds the drawer guide that uh, holds up the drawer, allows it to slide. And so I actually want to do um, some work on the drawers themselves. And uh, I got a, I caught a hard time yesterday for having my stream title be about plastic welding when I wasn't welding any plastic. So I'm going to uh, attempt to redeem myself. So this is the drawer that I built. And uh, it's made out of a uh, half-inch Baltic birch plywood, um, which is a, a very high-quality plywood. But it's also uh, one of the things that makes it high-quality is that it's very dense, meaning that it, it doesn't really have any voids in it. Uh, if you look at the cut edge here of, of the plywood, um, normal sheets of plywood uh, have occasional voids in them. And uh, this has almost none, and uh, so it's very, very solid, very strong uh, material. And the nice thing about not having uh, many voids in it is that you're not going to have a void in some place where it's going to affect your design. You know, like uh, for instance, on the very bottom of the drawer, you can see that I only have about five sixteenths of an inch underneath the uh, bottom drawer panel. And so if, you know, there was a flaw or something in that little piece that's underneath the drawer, uh, boom, you know, the bottom of the drawer could blow out. Um, but that's not as much of a risk with this material. Um, we did do some cutting down. Uh, there's a subframe here. And uh, I haven't cut down the plastic, so uh, may, may end up doing that today. Uh, and I have a plan for uh, this plywood. Because it is so um, void-free, uh, I had the thought of doing something very similar to what I did to a lot of my other wooden components. Um, but in that case, I did um, that with a drill press. I was able to set the drill press at the uh, proper depth and uh, drill all these holes into it um, just to remove that material and knock a little bit of weight off of it. Um, the structure of this component is mainly, you know, uh, holding the inside uh, pieces from being able to rock or move. And so I was able to remove material out of it and still keep it just about as strong. So uh, that's my thought on the drawers. Is, uh, well, there's, there's a lot of the drawer that's a little bit redundant. Like, for instance, I have a plate behind the drawer here. We may as well um, take this off. So that you can see the mounting plate. And uh, it, is, it is set up where I have all of these uh, T-nuts embedded in it. And then the drawer is bolted on from from the front into those T-nuts. Well, um, that's what's not going to, or that's not going to hold it onto the front of the drawer. What I need to do is uh, locate 
this frame from the inside of the drawer, uh, drill through it, and then put some uh, mounting bolts on the inside of the drawer. So it, it's going to be bolted in this way to the drawer front. Well, because of that, um, any material that is like in, you know, over these voids right here isn't really needed. And so I ordered a, a patterning bit and uh, it, it's a straight cutter on the end, but then above that straight cutter, it has a bearing on it. So uh, what I can do is make a pattern of all the cutouts that I want to do uh, in any of the sides of the drawers and uh, make a shallow cut in it. Uh, I'm thinking that I may cut it down where um, the bottom of the bit is just an eighth of an inch from the inside of the drawer. Uh, I don't think that um, I need to leave it any thicker than that. Maybe I'll go to 3 sixteenths. I don't know. But what it's going to do is just remove a whole lot of material um, out of the drawer itself. And I'll do that on the front. Um, like I said, everywhere that I can avoid a fastener location. Um, definitely on the sides. Again, avoiding where I actually mount my drawer guide. Uh, so I can do a pocket above this and several below it. I'm thinking of doing kind of a grid pattern here. And uh, you can see that I had to relieve the back side of the drawer. Sorry, probably can't see it in the camera. There you go. Uh, I had to relieve the back side of the drawer because it's actually that tight um, inside of that plastic box. Uh, I needed to give it some clearance. So I'll have to kind of stay away from that, but I can remove um, material from all the rest of it. So. Like I said, we've got a little bit of work to do on, on this piece after I remove uh, these bolts off the front. And uh, there is kind of a, a weak point to uh, this HDPE plastic piece on the front. And you can see that I had to leave these pockets for the latches to lay into. I wanted to keep um, the stock drawer front here uh, as much as possible. And so I've cut a, a pocket for the, for the latches to drop into, but this little finger right here doesn't really have anything to attach to. Uh, I can kind of flex that away. So my thought there was uh, I've had mixed results with welding the HDPE. I was originally planning on laying a little piece of HDPE, HDPE in here, kind of just like that and then welding it along this inside seam. And uh, yeah, I, like I said, I've had kind of mixed results with melt, uh, welding this plastic right here, HDPE or polyethylene. But the <coughs> box itself <coughs> is a different kind of plastic. And we kind of learned that through some trial and error where uh, I took a piece that I cut out of the drawer and uh, welded the seam and boom, you know, it, it welded it like permanently where you can flex uh, the plastic and it doesn't break the bond. Um, really did weld uh, the plastic together. So uh, I'm just saying I have a little bit more success with welding the PP or polypropylene. So uh, that made me think, well, maybe that's what I can do is uh, weld a little tab of polypropylene right here and uh, have some uh, plastic screws that I used on another aspect of my toolboxes. And they're very small, very short, um, but I should be able to screw that into the back of the HDPE and just make that section um, a little bit stronger. So if it gets caught on something, um, it's not going to um, bend the plastic, rip it off of there, whatnot. So um, hang on, looking around for where those plastic screws might be. I had to move around so much stuff here, trying to make room.
think I see it. Yes. So here's here's one of them. One of the plastic screws. And uh, you can see it's tiny. Um, that one might actually be too long, but I have two different lengths in here. There's the short ones. Okay. Pull one of these out of here. And uh, I bought these, um, and I found it kind of interesting, maybe you will too, that um, these screws are actually designed to screw into plastic. Um, you'll see that they actually have a uh, blunt end on them. So these are designed to go into plastic like you would drill a screw. And then the uh, threads on here are specifically designed to grab into that plastic. And it's a tiny little Torx screw. Um, you can see it's only like three-eighths of an inch long. So that was my thought is that, yeah, it'd be just about the right length to go through my little tab that I weld onto here and then screw into the plastic of the front. And uh, I won't drill all the way through, so you won't even see this screw. Um, it'll be fastened in from the back side of the drawer. And uh, you might be able to see it if you open the drawer all the way, but, uh, you know, big whoop. So let's... Let's put that away. Yeah, I got a whole big bag of them. It was definitely better to uh, buy them in bulk. That heater sure feels nice. So yeah, let's start taking this apart. I'm going to set the drawer aside for now. Like I said, I'm still waiting for uh, that bit to arrive. It should be here sometime this week. So next weekend, we'll get into uh, all of the pocketing and everything. Um, yeah, let's do the welding first. Especially since I'm all set up for it right here. I also was uh, short the number of screws that I needed to complete this project, so I have some more of those on order as well. was thinking that I should do uh, my bolt locations first, but I think in this case the order doesn't really matter. So while we're here, I did have kind of a thought about this. Um, as I as I explained, uh, I've done some work to the box to try to remove some weight out of it. And uh, one of the heavier components that I added to it was this piece of uh, HDPE plastic. Uh, it's not that it's, you know, made out of lead or something like that, but it is definitely... Um, heavier plastic. The HD stands for high density. And so this is um, 
very commonly used for cutting boards and stuff. It's very tough. Uh, doesn't get scuffed up very, very easily. And uh, so, like, when I cut it with these little fingers here, you can see that, you know, they're, they're not just snapping off of their, like, uh, acrylic wood. But, um, you know, it is heavier plastic, and when I... Uh, when I figured out that uh, this was right over the Milwaukee Packout logo, and we did this cutout um, to expose it, that uh, I might be able to do some more of that kind of work. So one thought is, you can see how all of this is cut out, and, and uh, we welded this plastic um, here on the stream. Um, that it would be possible to do maybe another cutout down here. You know, um, maybe maybe even that far, you know. Um, but then I would have to have something to cover over this. And my thought there is, well, uh, with those patterning bits or uh, or a rabbiting bit from the back side of the piece, I might actually be able to uh, cut in a little panel and then um, lay something thin across the inside. Um, I, could, I could put a sticker over the top of it, uh, paint it a different color. Um, somewhere I have some stickers and I've actually been looking for these for a while, and I have not been able to locate them in my shop. But they are um, checkerboard stickers. Hang on a second. I'm just going to see if I can find them. That would have made sense to put them in the drawer, right? Man, I sure hope I don't have to order those again just because I misplaced them. Ah. I have no idea. They may have fallen behind my bench or something stupid like that. All right, well, we won't worry about it right now. Uh, anyway, it's a checkerboard pattern. And, um, you know, as long as I had something fairly thin uh, underneath there that wouldn't punch through too easily, like, oh, I don't know, a piece of laminate. Um, piece of this foamed ABS. which is fairly thin, and because it's made out of foam, it's um, fairly lightweight. So that could go in there, and then I could put a, a, you know, that pattern of sticker over the top of it, and it would still leave uh, some of this HDPE plastic sticking out far enough that it would protect it. Yeah, even a piece of acrylic would probably work. Or uh, sheet metal. Sheet metal would work. Anyway, I'll, uh, I'll look into uh, doing something with that. Um, but I think as long as I leave like a framework um, I even had thoughts of, man, if I had, um, you know, CNC carving uh, capabilities, uh, you could actually carve a design into this, you know, and then back it up um, with something to give it some relief. And that would be pretty cool. 
but it also might make it make it a little bit harder to clean. So um, we'll see. Yeah, and actually, um, if it was something that was very similar, now I'm kind of curious. I think I have a scrap of this stuff here. If this was pretty close to the thickness of this plastic, then I could just cut some of that out. You know, make a make a cut like right here. So um, this would be backed up by the framework. You could have it miss all the bolts. Just have it kind of trapped in there. And then, like I said, apply the, the sticker over the top of it. I, I'm actually liking that idea quite a bit. And if I did that, then I wouldn't have to worry about uh, machining out the back side of this. I could just do the cutout and have it lay over and, and trap a piece in there. And that seems like it'd be a cool thing to do. Uh, the, the thickness is not quite the same. But that could probably be remedied too, you know, with just like some uh, mounting tape or something. Just something that would uh, stick that piece on there, uh, but also lift it up a little bit. And then uh, when we attach our HDPE to the front, um, it would just compress it very slightly. Okay, I'm going to separate these, <clears throat> and uh, real quickly, you can see I have a line where that portion of the plastic uh, hangs over this piece. So we're just going to quickly take care of that. I think I'll use my trusty belt sander for that. care of that. Leaves a little fuzz on the front.
and just a knife to uh, trim it up. I definitely feel that um, the plastic welding is one of the coolest things I learned from doing this project. Because as you can see, um, this was the piece that was cut out of the front of the drawer, right in there. And uh, so this didn't exist until I took some of the cutout pieces from here and welded them together and then also welded them to the front panel of the box. And what that did is it gave me a bolting location here uh, right in the center that wouldn't compress. But you can see that even when I just belt sanded a little bit of the plastic off, the, the bond here is just very, very good. It's definitely welded together and not um, kind of fastened together. Okay. So right in here is where I'm wanting to uh, weld a piece on. And uh, unfortunately our latch is just kind of a little bit in the way of me getting a good weld right here. Hey, good morning to you, Buji. How are you doing, man? Just cleaning up some plastic, uh, kind of showing off where I, I weld this piece back in. And uh, I have an idea. I'm going to run it by you, okay? So in order to give this a little bit more style, um, continue knocking some more weight out of it, uh, the thought I had was... Uh, latch being a batch, kind of, uh, you can remove them. Uh, I can see how I could remove it, but I'm wondering if I want to even take the effort to do that. We'll see, because uh, I want to do a weld right in here uh, to add a tab so that I can screw into the HDPE from the back. That's kind of my goal. Um, but down here, you know, we have this big uh, blank area and uh, what my thought was, was that I could cut another window like I did here. And underneath it, if I took a piece of this lighter weight uh, foamed ABS sheet and kind of uh, set it in there, like so, then I could uh, take some of the sticker paper, uh, and I can't find them right now. I feel like an idiot. Like I said, they might have fallen behind the bench, which is kind of hard to get to. But uh, I have some checkerboard stickers that I was going to apply in other places on my boxes, just to kind of tie them together uh, in a theme. And what I could do is just put that uh, entire checkerboard section right in there. Now the HDPE would be the furthest out point and it's um, arguably the toughest plastic so that would protect all this stuff from abrasion much like uh, you know this cutout is going to protect this uh, logo um, to a certain extent because um, because stuff is going to bump into this HDPE. What is the total weight of the HDPE? That is a good question. We do have the ability to weigh it, don't we? Yeah, let's, let's find that out.
1.36 pounds. So if I was to get a nice cutout out of it, I could save eh, probably not half of it. Maybe a third of it. So you might lose four to five ounces tops. Well, and then I would be adding some plastic in too. This, uh, this foamed ABS, but it is lighter weight. So yeah, net, net is what? You know, maybe 0.4 pounds or something. Let's actually change the units. Okay, so this is in ounces. So it weighs uh, 21.73 ounces. I may lose, uh, what did I say, like a third of that? So seven ounces, almost a half a pound. thinking it might be worth it because I did all that drilling on all the other components and I saved about a half a pound I think from just a uh, styling point of view I kind of want to do it you're lazy <laughs> yeah I get it Well, I, I've been thinking about, like, where do I put that um, checkerboard sticker on here? Man, I know I had it close by. I'm trying to think of where I would have even put it away. Uh, here's some checkerboard tape. And this stuff, by the way, ended up being terrible. I thought it was going to be a cool accent. But the adhesive just sucks. Like it's not very sticky. But this is, um, this is uh, actually reflective. And uh, I don't know, maybe in a, a trapped scenario like this, this would be a this would be a way to go. You know, if I, I uh, apply this with spray glue and then actually trap it with a frame, that might actually work. And it would make it stand out at night. Um, it's not very often that I have to um, work on bikes at night, but, you know, just to have some reflectivity, I don't know, a little bit of, a little bit of look and style to it might be cool. Well, we'll consider that. I, like I said, I will find the other uh, checkerboard vinyl and we'll uh, and we can play around with it but if I do create that panel inside of there um, then I have options okay enough messing around so yeah you can see that the latch is a separate piece and uh, there's a couple of tabs underneath here that if you could get something underneath here and pry up on it a little bit, you could probably slide this out. Um, because I think it just snaps in there. So let's take a look at that. I'm 
maybe I have a thin enough pry bar to get in here. The hard part is getting it to pry over both of them at the same time. And then how do I get enough pressure to get it past that? I don't know. I don't know if it's even worth it. Could end up wrecking the latch. I'm of the uh, opinion that the extra weight will be imperceptible where you have it located. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I continue to get into it. <laughs> Uh, on my post about the air-filled wheels because somebody suggested if you're worried about flats then you should just fill the tire with foam and I'm like uh, no uh, internally I'm saying that's that's a very bad idea that was really a dumb thing to say I mean do you fill your car tires with foam And uh, I just explained. It's like, look, I've had wheelbarrows uh, with a tube and a tire that lasted and lasted until the tube or the tire or both were just completely rotten. And that's when they failed. I never got a puncture in the decade of use of, of uh, install TPMS sensors. Ooh, they actually make them, dude. No, there's actually a, a device that you can buy for bicycles. And you could add it to it, and it would tell you what the pressure is, and you uh, can look at that on, on an app. Kind of crazy. They do have them for bicycles, but uh, yeah, they're, they're expensive and dumb. <laughs> and I just had to explain again, you know that uh, I'm not worried about it. You know, the whole reason for putting air-filled tires is that I wanted air-filled tires. I wanted to be able to adjust the air pressure, you know, according to how much load I have in this, in this uh, box. And uh, people just didn't get it, man. I guess, you know, fixing a flat tire is just the most uh, horrific thing that they can think of doing, you know, or having to inflate them. I think is uh, ins expensive a dumb or my middle name. <laughs> well, I'm right there with you. Oh, it looks like I can get this out of the way enough. But uh, yeah, right here is where I want to weld that tab. And I really only have um, to the cut here. So it's, it's going to end up being a very, very thin little piece that I'll be welding on there. And I may only be able to weld it from the back side. Here's a piece of the pack out plastic. But yeah, if I get that shaped right there and I can get a good weld on the back side, then I should be able to get a screw into the HDPE on this side. But I got to figure out how to uh, how to hold this flat. Uh, 
I think people overestimate how easy it is to puncture a tire with only a couple hundred pounds loaded in, in it. Uh, I don't even know that it's a couple hundred pounds. Uh, it might be a couple hundred pounds between both boxes. Uh, I've actually been researching uh, buying a scale. There's, uh, there's like postal scales that are uh, large enough that a person could stand on it. Uh, it goes on the floor. Uh, the the uh, display is actually mounted to the wall. There's a little wire that comes up from it. And, um, and I thought, you know, that would be a good thing to have here in my shop um, for all kinds of stuff, you know, weighing bicycles. Um, I just go and I weigh myself, tear the scale, and then pick up a bicycle and stand on the scale again. That would give me a I could use a cheap bathroom scale. I absolutely could. But I wanted one that had, um, you know, enough range, like 400 pounds or something. And what I can do is uh, pick up these boxes and, uh, you know, weigh each one of them individually. There's like, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine boxes to weigh in the in the total stack mine does up to 330 pounds with allegedly 0.1 pound precision uh yeah uh, like i said i've been kind of researching them and they're of all different accuracies and price ranges and whatnot uh, and I picked one out, and other stuff took priority. But, uh, yeah, it is a goal to have one here in the shop. And the, the thing is, I want to, like, leave it. <laughs> so I'm going to try to find a place in the shop where... Uh, you know, I could just leave it set up all the time. Anytime I want to weigh stuff, walk over to it, step on it, do my thing, and then uh, I don't have to put it away. And uh, and a lot of the scales that I've been looking at are uh, are definitely of that type. You know, they're meant to be used like in a mail room or something like that. So. I would imagine this be. going to be able to take some bumps and bruises. Okay, that's actually a pretty good fit there. But I, I really need, like, Maybe only a couple of screws in it. Mail room? <laughs> no, not that kind of room. The real bummer about this is that I actually removed this material that I'm trying to put back on here. But yeah, just a little tab with a couple of screws in it, I think would be enough. So I may just cut this in half. Oh. That'll teach you to take risks. Exactly. That's it. I'm never taking a risk again. I'm done. Only the safe way from here on out. <laughs>
I hate shopping at Safeway. Ah, that's kind of our go-to. But uh, yesterday, I wanted some stuff for the uh, kimbap I was talking about. And uh, around here, the city market is the more upscale market of the two. A little. And uh, anyway, we were shopping for a for a few ingredients that we knew we probably weren't going to find at Safeway. And uh, I was actually kind of surprised that um, City Market had the better price on, on several of the items that we, that we wanted. So might have to, uh, might have to give them another chance. I think that's going to work. So how do we hold it there? That's the question I'm puzzling. Um, you know, the front of this is flat. And uh, I like to back it up with the metal tape. That seems to... I only mega sail shop Safeway. And I think the metal tape will hold it together, but it won't hold it this way. So I'm wondering if, um, I don't know, maybe I apply something on here. Like, I don't know, a metal ruler. Just tape that on here, tape it to the back side of that, it'll keep it flat. Ooh, in the past they've had uh, 29 cents a pound corned beef brisket on March 18th. Yeah, I might have to keep an eye out for that. Because, man, I could throw that on the smoker. Yeah, I think there's enough room that I can just kind of tape this over and that'll keep it rigid. And then when I flip it over, I can do my weld. So I might want to give this a little bit of relief here. Um, give it that V-groove that seems to really help. Grab my small belt here. So I can get my weld down in there. Let's see. I tried smoking corned beef, and I got to say that the results were salty. Maybe a 24-hour debriding might help. Ah. Yeah, I guess it would be kind of briny, wouldn't it? Because that's the definition of corned beef, is it's brined. Uh, in the past, I've just boiled it. I think boiling removes a lot of the salt. Brined in potassium nitrate. I guess I haven't really read into it. There we go. the right way. Uh, 
It seems to be pretty flush. Salt Peter. But can you extract it to make gunpowder? That's a question everybody's asking, you know. Okay, a little tab set up there. Man, that's not a lot of room. All right, let's find my uh, welding rods. There's one already cut right there. I'll grab another one if I need it. Let that crank up. Do a little preheating here. Seems like it's still pretty cold. Maybe use that metal ruler as a heat break. Well, I'll tell you what, this tool, um, the soldering station is pretty specific. It really does pinpoint the heat where, uh, where you want it to be. That's well, actually getting a little shiny there. Thinking that I just don't have enough heat. So I'm going to crank it up.
Oh, there I'm starting to get that that color. Oh yeah, it's laying down in there. Trying to keep the heat moving around so that I'm heating up uh, behind my welding rod as well as melting the rod. Trying to uh, heat up both pieces of base plastic. And with a little bit of pressure on the rod too to try to get it to kind of push into that little puddle. And also down into the V-groove, because trying not to uh, leave it too proud where it's going to interfere with me putting that little tiny screw in from the back side. Now I'm just trying to get the the rod to melt and release. There it goes. And the Viking Naz, hey, how are you doing? Sorry, I had my head down in it. <laughs> yes, my Viking brother. Ethylene glycol, huh? Doesn't PP need a lower temp? Uh, yes, yeah, slightly lower than uh, than the HDPE. Oh, and my ruler came off of there. That wasn't good. Still seems like it stayed pretty flat, though. Well, might as well pull it all the way off now. I'll do a little bit better job taping it onto this side. We'll do the other side. Did you use the commercial PP sticks or an offcut? Uh, you're taking the last two days off because they got two wisdom teeth taken out and they were impacted. So it's super painful. So I'm just chilling out. Yeah, I don't blame you, man. Take it easy on yourself for a bit. So yeah, there's my uh, welded on tab and it feels solid. We'll see, because I need to uh, still cut this off, you know, and uh, shape it just a little bit. But it does feel like it's welded on there. Yeah, that's all I was trying to do, is just get a tab put back on there. And uh, like I said, I, I am a little bit more confident in, the, in welding this uh, polypropylene. It just seems to work regardless of how I approach it, whereas the uh, HDPE is a lot more fickle. 
So speaking of cutting it off of there, I need to think about what I can use to, uh, to cut that off of there. Maybe just a cutoff wheel and the die grinder. Um, I, I need to just kind of cut it rough and then I can shave it down. But uh, where are my, my wrenches? Yeah, there's a there's a cutoff wheel. Oh, right there. I think you're fighting the thickness of the HDPE. I'd attach it and cut it with a knife using the uh, PE sheet as a guide. I guess I don't follow. Um, it is kind of thick, so uh, cutting it with a knife is, is, I mean, it's fine to trim off a little bit of uh, burr or something like that, but um, it would actually take a lot of pressure to cut it with a knife, and that's what I'm trying to avoid is, you know, uh, this one I only welded on one side because I'm trying not to mar the plastic on this side. And I think that's probably going to be enough attachment for what it's actually doing. Um, but it's just so much um, safer, I guess, to just, you know, cut it off roughly and then shave it down with the belt sander. Um, as we saw this morning, uh, these sections that I welded in previously, uh, no, no, it'll get covered up um was a little bit long because we had to cut down our frame for uh clearance at the bottom and uh so i shaved this all down to that line that we drew on the back side of it and uh even though that that piece looks fragile i mean it's just it's welded on there it's just not yes it'll be covered by the pe sheet exactly So yeah, let me just cut this off of here. Let this cool down a little bit and then we'll shave it in a little bit closer. In the meantime, we'll get this side welded. And need to do a little more shaping. It's just a slightly different radius on the inside here. Um, but I'm wondering if I, I should do it on this piece. Make that tab a little wider Yeah, I like that better. Okay, check our fit. Yeah, I still need to um, change the radius a little bit. It's also good. It it this wasn't really nicely trimmed. Now it's uh, now it's a lot better.
It was so painful that I quit smoking. <laughs> How are you doing, SWK? Yeah. Not an angle grinder, but... Again, messing with the plastic. Um, I'm a dumbass, and I didn't foresee every facet of this uh, project. And that if I would have left a little tab of plastic here, that I'd be able to uh, bolt on from the back. About to have to go play plumber. Oh, boy. Well, you know, all you need to know is that uh, pot's on the left. And you're not a turd herder. <laughs> and Jack Frost, hey, thank you for the raid. Sorry, I don't have the... The big parade of uh, raid notification, but uh, I actually am welding some plastic today. Uh, as I was just explaining, I didn't have uh, perfect foresight, and uh, I needed a little bit of plastic right here uh, in order to screw into the back of the uh, of the faceplate, and so I just welded one back on. See that little piece right there? And that's my weld down inside of there. Unfortunately, this is nothing that you will see. Um, but it is important for the function of the piece because of the way I had to make it. Um, these little fingers of uh, HDPE right here are just unsupported. So now that I have this tab welded on here, I'll be able to fasten into it from the back with a tiny little screw. And uh, there's one of the screws right there. It's actually a plastic thread screw, meaning that it's, it's meant to hold in plastic. So I'll have to draw, drill a tiny little hole, make sure it doesn't go all the way through my, my HDPE here, but that's a quarter of an inch thick, so I should be able to get a decent bite into there. And then that'll keep that from catching on stuff and, and getting bent. And then the rest of the board is held on here um, with bolts. So that was the only part I couldn't really get a fastener into. But uh, fortunately, during the process, we did learn how to weld plastic. And uh, you can see I've got a piece attached on here with some metal tape. That was kind of a cool little technique that I saw. Uh, oh, you know what? I, I, again, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Uh, on the other piece, what I did is on the back side where I'm going to put my weld, um, I did a little chamfer there, and that creates a little V groove so that I can get my weld down into that joint and uh, give it a little bit more surface area of contact. Um, I can't really weld on the front of the box for fear of um, distorting the plastic or discoloring the plastic and uh, having it show. So yeah, perhaps a little bit of vanity but I think just the weld on the back will give it enough strength for uh, the purpose. Normally you're all about things getting bent. I mean, you can get bent. <laughs> oh, bougie. And so what I did on the other one is I just um, taped a ruler on here. just to keep it flat. I'll actually bend that around there a little bit. Yeah, so that'll keep it flat. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, and we're using a uh, hot air rework station here and a uh, polypropylene rod. It actually took us a while to figure out that that's what this plastic actually is, is polypropylene. And then once you get the proper rod and the right temperature, and uh, I even bought an accessory nozzle for the tool to get my heat exactly where I want it to be, um, the rest of it is just kind of some technique, waiting, uh, you know, waiting for the tool to heat up, uh, preheating the base plastic a little bit. And then just like you were uh, stick welding uh, metal, you just melt this rod down into that joint. It fuses to the base plastic. And uh, there's, there's your plastic weld. And uh, I've learned, you know, quite a bit. I'm not an expert, but I've gotten to the point where um, my my welds are holding. So I guess that's the main goal. And, uh, you know, I figure the more often I do this, the prettier the weld is going to get. As I get more, uh, more practice in. And if I just quit screwing up, then uh, maybe I wouldn't have to do it so much. But hey, you know, the whole project has been an experiment. And really, the whole project is, is all about learning stuff. You know, what can I do? What can't I do? What technique works? Which one doesn't? How do we get the right temperature? Uh, you know, how do we prepare the plastic? Fortunately, this uh, polypropylene doesn't take a whole lot of uh, plastic prep. It seems to weld just fine with uh, without anything. But, you know, maybe that will be the answer with the uh, HDPE is that I'm just not not preparing it properly. And if I can figure out how to prepare it, then I can weld the uh, HDPE better. TIG welding plastic. <laughs> You're an accessory nozzle. Probably. So let it cool down a little bit. That time the tape stayed. Get our stiff back off of there. And you can see that that tab is now, you know, part of the other plastic. You know, and not entirely pretty on the back, but um, yeah, if it's if it's an effective weld, that's really all I needed.
So let's do a little cleanup on this. Yep, gave it some ears. First off, we'll just trim this off roughly. And I'll save these pieces of plastic in case I need to do any other repairs. Um, that is one thing that's true about uh, plastic welding. Looks better than my contractor's trim work, but that's not saying much. Ouch. Sorry to hear that. I've been running into that a lot lately. Actually, I think I might bring out the big boy for this. It's just faster. There we go pretty pretty flush with this cut up there which is kind of my limit for the for the piece and it really doesn't leave me a whole lot of room back here but there is enough so I'll just uh, drill into there and and uh, set a tiny little screw into the back side of my HDPE and problem will be solved So let's lay our uh, piece back on here so I can show you what it is that I'm trying to do. So from the, from the back, now I have uh, a little ear right here that I can screw through. You should have seen the pics on Discord. You would cringe. <laughs> like a true material hoarder? Yeah. Well, when you have the right plastic to weld something together, um, from here you can't tell it was added back, other than it's a little notch. Yeah, like I said, this is the back side of the drawer, so... Yeah, um, I probably should be saving all of my uh, HDPE scrap, right? So I can make a mallet like you've been doing, Shanigans. I really want one of those. I would commission one from you. But like I said, I want uh, I want a more classic mallet shape, like this one. Um, this one has the uh, replaceable faces, different uh, durometers of rubber. But honestly, one of my favorite ones is uh, this one right here. It's a, uh, it's a urethane mallet, and it's very lightweight. Ah, the traditional style, yeah, with the, the handle drilled through it. And really all I would need the head, I can make my own handle. Um, I have some other handles. Um, you can see that this one is just kind of inserted in there. There's no uh, pin or anything holding it, but um, yeah, I, 
I uh, used to have a toolbox at uh, the bike shop and I had this mallet in my toolbox and uh, it, it had been a while since I'd been uh, been back to the shop and I came in to see that this mallet had been used for God knows what. Um, but it was all mushroomed out on the end and just like somebody had used it like a sledgehammer. And I'm like, no, that is not what that is for. This is for some, giving something a light wrap, you know, uh, that you don't want to damage. And you're swinging it hard enough that you're probably going to cause damage anyway and you damage the hammer. <laughs> so I took it away from them and put it back in my home shop and uh, eventually I had to like belt sand the ends to get them uh, even to this shape. But I found this to be super uh, useful and handy. And, uh, and here's the thing, um, shenanigans, I don't need uh, one that's like large enough. I would actually love to have one that is uh, the traditional conical shape for uh, chisels. But I would love to have one about this size in HDPE. Um, because I think you, you actually could generate a little bit uh, harder blow with a little bit denser plastic. Uh, this urethane here, it's, uh, it's, it's hard. And, um, you know, it, it's pretty much the same thing that skateboard wheels are made out of. But I think skateboard wheels are made a little bit softer urethane so that they grip better. This is kind of like the old school uh, urethane wheels that I grew up with that were kind of terrible. <laughs> but it makes a good hammer. And uh, anyway, I'm, I was just going to buy a new uh, buy a new hammer. And I couldn't find one. I would have just bought a replacement when I found it so damaged. This is also another very uh, common mallet used in the bike shop, and they call it a donkey hammer because uh, I guess apparently it's a, it's a leather mallet, um, but sometimes they use uh, donkey leather to make these out of. And again, just kind of a soft blow uh, you know, if you're, you're trying to uh, remove a, a stem that has a quill bolt in it, um, that's how you remove it, as you unscrew it. Usually see those with rawhide, yeah. But yeah, like, like I said, that's just what people in the bike industry call it, is a donkey mallet. Anyway, it doesn't have a very good handle. It's not a very good tool. And uh, quite frankly, I don't use it all that much. It just kind of sits on my wall for the most of the time. Yeah, reducing damage to what you're striking. Exactly. You know, uh, steel parts, chrome finishes, uh, anodized aluminum. They're all uh, subject to damage if you use a steel hammer on them. And so you just always use something softer. Uh, I have another brass hammer in... Uh, in my box, and uh, I like that a lot, too. Let's see if I can grab my brass hammer. I've shown this off more than once. But, yeah, this is the brass hammer that I bought at a yard sale for two bucks. And you can see it's, it's pretty small. Um, yeah, like not even nine and a half inches long. But uh, what I thought of it when I saw it was, it's like that's somebody's machine shop project, you know? Like they they went to a, went to a community college or a night school or something like that and took a machining class and, and uh, made this up, you know? The handle's all knurled and then step down, uh, all made out of aluminum. Uh, the shaft is steel, and then uh, the head is brass, and there's actually a, a steel pin 
uh, driven all the way through it. And uh, once I saw it, it's like, man, that is, that is a nice hammer for uh, when you have to actually give a fairly heavy blow. Um, I'll, I'll tell you my favorite story with this specific hammer right here. Uh, a, a man from Korea was touring across the United States on his bicycle. And he spoke uh, very good English. Uh, I speak no Korean. But um, he had dented his rim. And so, uh, you know, every time the, the rim went around, it was going thump, 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 thump. And this guy was putting in a lot of miles across the U.S., thousands of miles. He said, it's driving me crazy. And I said, well, you know, typically when you have rim damage like that, you replace the rim. But we don't actually have a rim like that in stock. So I can't just replace it. He says, well, can you try to hammer it out, like repair it? I'm like, you know, <laughs> I don't know if I can. But if you're willing to take the risk that I could destroy your rim, then I'll do it for you. Let me tell you a story about heavy blows. <laughs> anyway, I set up his wheel uh, up on some, up on some uh, uh, pieces of 2 by 4 to support it. And then I put another piece of wood right over where that that flat spot was in the rim. Wham! One hit. It knocked the, the ding out of it and fixed the rim. And the guy took off. I was like, well, that was kind of cool. Well, at the time, I was dating a lady uh, a few towns away. And uh, there's a big festival there called uh, Fibark. It's the uh, biggest whitewater uh, rafting celebration west of the Mississippi. And they have a big, big carnival and uh, all these events. And uh, I ran into the same guy. I'm like, oh my gosh. I said, you made it this far. That's awesome. I said, how was the rim? He says, it's perfect now. <laughs> So yeah, just uh, uh, some well-placed kinetic energy can uh, can really make a difference. So yeah, I've kind of always kept this hammer with me. Never know when that opportunity might come up again. Oops, sorry, all my tools fell out of their pallet here. And I am going to be bringing in this uh, toolbox with me to class today. Okay, so, yeah, that kind of fixed that issue. I'll, uh, I'll work on drilling the hole and stuff later. But this one could go back together. And then we could figure out the fasteners into this from the drawer. So, yeah, that's, you know, all of this bolts into here through the front. To hold this together and then there's t-nuts embedded in it on the back side but uh, what I want to do from the inside of the drawer is the reverse of this I want to drill through this uh, at the front in a couple of spots and I'll I'll have to locate where that is maybe there 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 and at the top of the drawer Yeah, that'll have to be pretty carefully placed. Um, the other thing that I probably will end up doing too is uh, driving a screw into the drawer right in here uh, on the latch because, you know, this piece 
on the back doesn't really cover this corner. So I'm thinking I can pick up some uh, stiffness and strength by drilling a screw through into the drawer from the outside. Okay, and uh, I just want to put this back together temporarily. Just to keep track of all my pieces. There we go. Yeah, you can see how that one dropped in there. Everything lined up. Nice thing about using the T-nuts is you can run these bolts in and out as many times as necessary. Unlike a wood screw that would eventually kind of wear itself out and not hold anymore. There you go. And this one we need to remove off of the drawer. Um, we have it kind of temporarily held. That's how I got this aligned as I used uh, a couple of the holes for that sandwich to, uh, to screw into the front of the drawer while the drawer was installed. And that, so that lined up the uh, drawer face. So that's my temporary solution. I need to come up with my more permanent solution. And so, yeah, this one has the, uh, the same issue as the other one. So we might as well weld the plastic now, take care of it. You can see I have the same issue with this one. Needs that piece added in there again. I thought you left it on that one. No, uh, what I did leave on this one, because this is the second box I cut, was uh, this plastic right here. So that when you open up the drawer, that's all you see is that plastic. And you can see how that's, that peels away there. So that's what those screws will do, is they'll hold it in tight and uh, it should keep the front of the box nice and flat. But uh, uh, this was the first one that we did and I actually removed that material. So on this one, the, the wooden frame is exposed on the end. Um, but what I thought I would do is, uh, you know, do, do any of my final cleanup on, on these and then I'm probably just going to put a piece of red tape on there so that it just kind of blends in. So yeah, this one 
this one you can see the plywood, this one you can't. And you know, if I could turn back time. If I could turn back time. Whoa, sorry. I did not mean to subject you to share. And uh, like I said, we've trimmed down that frame as well. And uh, the plastic hangs down a little bit. So, or paint that piece red. Yeah, I could also do that. I think it's just actually easier to uh, add the tape because the tape blends with the color almost perfectly. I think as long as it's it looks consistent, and there's uh, some other pieces that I may end up covering up with red as well, uh, the red tape. So I think it'll it'll look natural. That is a good blend. Yeah, I got lucky there because uh, it's not like they have a whole bunch of shades of red duct tape to choose from and you can get just the you know the Milwaukee pack out red that most people probably won't even know I'll, I'll ask a question here in a, in a minute. You can see I was actually going to cut out the back side of this too. And uh, I'm glad I didn't and retained the Milwaukee Packout logo. Yeah, so I should be saving all this for my mallet, right? <laughs> it all melts together. So, yeah, when I just did that, um, I mentioned it on the last one that I was pretty pleased with how well that weld holds. You know, I'm subjecting it to uh, a pretty good amount of stress there. And the weld here and here and here, no problems. So before I do this next weld, I'm going to ask 
um, anybody who's watching, um, just a, a, an aesthetic question. So um, I originally didn't even have the cutout here for the Milwaukee Packout logo. Um, but, you know, as the project started progressing, uh, I did things like started cutting windows out of uh, the components uh, just to remove material that wasn't needed. Um, I did the same with all of the uh, internal structural components. You know, after we got it all assembled and the drawer working, uh, we just, you know, drilled a bunch of speed holes in here. Um, just to remove all the material that was a little bit redundant. And uh, just on these components right here, uh, there's a few more pieces over here, I saved about a half a pound. Well, we got, uh, I got to thinking about the uh, HDPE sheet, and uh, it is definitely a denser plastic than uh, the polypropylene that the box is made out of. And so I thought, well, you know, uh, I can cut that out and it'll shave a little bit more weight out of it. Well, now what I'm uh, debating is whether I want to do a larger cutout here. You can see my bolt pattern, you know, there. And I just, I have this big void. And uh, I'm thinking not only from, you know, cutting a little bit more plastic out of the box, uh, we weighed just this panel, and it weighs like 1.3 pounds or something like that. Just this piece of plastic is is almost a pound and a half. Um, so the more of that that I can cut out, the more weight I'm going to save. And the thought I had was, well, uh, behind this uh, and on top of and on top of this frame. If I were to, you know, cut this back a little bit, so my bolts are still going through the original box plastic, but I create a little shelf here where I can cut a piece of uh, lightweight plastic, and I have this uh, foamed ABS sheet, which is really nice, uh, flexible stuff because it's uh, the 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 core of it is foamed. Um, the, the outside of it is pretty, you know, water resistant and whatnot. Um, so I was thinking about dropping in a piece of that, uh, windowing this, and then giving it kind of a graphic treatment. Um, I have some uh, vinyl, uh, vinyl sheets, you know, just like a letter size vinyl sheet that uh, has a checkerboard pattern on it. Uh, one of my previous... Uh, thoughts was, well, it would be nice to have a checkerboard that was reflective. And so I bought this tape right here. And as it turns out, it has like bad adhesive on it. Um, it just doesn't stick very well. But it does have the pattern that I was looking for. And uh, the thing is, if I had, you know, this panel here cut out, um, I could use spray adhesive and attach some of this uh, reflective tape on there. Get my checkerboard pattern insert. Um, you know, I'd get the reflective qualities of the tape and, and the pattern that I'm looking for. Uh, Bougie says he's lazy and uh, he wouldn't take the time to do something like that. But that's Bougie. And you know me, if I can make it more complicated and make it take more time, well, I'm your huckleberry. No, I'm saying for all those reasons, to get uh, kind of a different aesthetic for it, uh, knock a little bit more weight out of it, still not lose any strength, have a place to put my graphics on there. That sort of thing. All that, you're going to make a panel door. Yep, it is kind of a panel door. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, I uh, was really glad when we made the decision to cut the window in this. Like I said, it saved a little bit of weight. 
But, you know, I got the, the graphic back again. Otherwise, it was just a big blank red panel. And so any graphics, um, I would have to add to it. Uh, well, the problem with that is nothing sticks to this HDPE very well. I mean, you saw how well this metal tape stuck to the uh, polypropylene. I don't know that it sticks as well. Well, because there's a, there's a texture added to the plastic, too. So I'm not really getting a good adhesive bond. Whereas uh, this plastic right here has, has definitely a smoother surface. Ah, uh, peel, you bastard. Yeah, most of the time it peels real easy. It's probably because I got people watching me. Quit looking! Don't look! Save you a lot of work. Ah, keeping it out as is and build a graphic plate and screw it to the front. Save you a lot of work. Maybe. But I'm definitely intrigued about uh, cutting out a little bit more of this plastic because, yeah, hot dog fingers, exactly. Well, and no fingernails. There it went. So, yeah, I mean, if I stick this tape to this stuff, it, it bonds pretty well. It's, it's kind of hard to peel off of there. But stick it to this. It just, it doesn't bond very well because it's such a textured surface. But, you know, if I did put uh, a decal or whatever on, onto a piece of this, and I would also be pinning it down you know, uh, my cutout would actually go over the top of this, and kind of pin it into place. I don't know why I asked you. I'm going to do what I want to do anyway. <laughs> I think that's what I want to do. One thing I like about it is creating that, uh, that window in this is if I got sick of the graphics on here, I could change it. Very easily. You know, unbolt the, the front plate and just put a new sticker on there. If it got kind of worn out or something like that. Or if I wanted to put more of uh, my own logoing in there. So, yeah, I think that's what I want to do. Okay, let's weld some plastic. So like I said, I can uh, I can do a little bit more cleanup in here. There's still a little bit of a ridge, and uh, I'm trying to get that piece to be as wide as I possibly can. Um, so I'm ac actually going to take this plastic back a little bit. And uh, that way my V-groove is just right there in kind of the inside 90 degrees. There we go. I can't go much farther than that, so stop there. 
Let's do the same thing to prep out this side. This one's a lot closer. It's just kind of at that very end. Needed a little bit of help. So here's the other half of that same piece of plastic. So we'll just shape that until it fits pretty well. Square off that side. Flatten that side. Might as well get this one too. We'll move to the uh, other finer tool. We get some plastic out of the way. Get it trimmed up. So I was watching a video um, this morning, and, and I try not to get too sucked into those Facebook videos because they always pop an ad in there and annoy me. But it was a guy making a radio control bus out of PVC pipe. The guy literally took um, a PVC pipe, cut a slit down the length of it, um, heated it up, put weights on it, flattened it down into sheets, and then he just started to cut up the sheets and start started making all these components out of plastic. And uh, it looked like he was using super glue, but it might have been some sort of uh, similar PVC glue. But uh, yeah, it was actually, it sucked me in pretty good and it was pretty fascinating just to watch him fabricating all this stuff out of plastic. And especially such a, a cheap and commonly available plastic, you know. Um, I guess that's the part I liked about it was it was definitely a lot more about um, his craftsmanship than, uh, than anything else. So I like that fit pretty well. Hopefully it, um, plumbing PVC glue should work. Yeah, he, well, he was using an applicator that looked like it was uh, super glue or something. Uh, and they, and they of course don't tell you what it is in the video, but, um, you know, he was doing all kinds of stuff, uh, needed some thicker pieces. So he'd take, take, uh, thin strips and then stack them up and glue them together. I think there was a little bit of editing magic in it because he was gluing up one of those stacks and I saw the gaps and then in the next photo when he's working with the piece it didn't didn't have any gaps so you won't get any of that silliness here if I fuck something up you're gonna see it live Honestly, that is one of the reasons why um, I haven't really focused on my YouTube channel. Is, uh, you know, I see what other people do with it. And I'm not saying all the videos on there are fake or anything like that. I'm just saying that uh, you can't always believe what you're seeing. And uh, it doesn't necessarily give you a correct idea of uh, it might be illegal to transfer the material into a different container. Yeah, probably for shipping purposes. But uh, for application purposes, yeah, you can put whatever you want into a little bottle. 
but uh, yeah, it just doesn't it doesn't give you a realistic idea of how long uh, a project might actually take. Okay, we'll do this a little bit different this time. I actually did like this rounded end over here. So I'm just taping this on here to give some support to this little flap. It only has tape on one side, and so I'm just using the, uh, the ruler as uh, what we would call a stiff back in carpentry. Like when you set uh, a gable end, uh, it's just kind of sitting on another wall and hanging out there in space. And so what we'll do is we'll create an L um, out of, you know, two by fours, two by sixes, and fasten them to the lower section of the wall and project it up to the upper section. Very rarely, yeah. Well, and I think that's, you know, the magic of editing is... Uh, you can make something look like, oh, piece of cake, and then you try it yourself, and you're like, what? It reminds me a little bit of this show I watched a long, long time ago. Uh, being in the trades, I don't actually watch too many... Uh, DIY shows, okay? Because <laughs> uh, it just doesn't interest me. I mean, that's what I do for work. Why would I want to watch more of it once I get home, you know? I want some uh, different sort of entertainment. But uh, I was stuck at home. I was sick or something, and I was watching the show, and they were talking about making um, concrete pavers. Always look for the, I tried to do X and hilarity ensued. Those are probably more entertaining. Ooh, I got it very warm in here. I'm going to shut off my heater. Um, anyway, uh, and informative, yeah. It is kind of good to know what could go wrong, right? So anyway, um, yeah, concrete pavers for the garden. And they take a couple two-by-fours, and they uh, nail them together, they make a little form, throw it on the ground, and then give you the formula for concrete, which is so many parts water to so many parts uh, Portland cement to so many parts sand and so many parts gravel, Okay. And then they mix this all up and they pour it into a little form uh, on the ground. They scrape off the top and, and go, okay, now you know how to do concrete. <laughs> and I it just, I laughed out loud because it's like, you don't know that they make sackcrete. I mean, if you're trying to tell somebody that they can, you know, pour a little paver in their in their yard yeah tell them to go buy a sack of concrete don't don't tell them to buy a truckload of sand and a truckload of gravel and and make up their own concrete that's 